I'll kind of be remembered because people will see my name on these films. It's a great feeling. There's an immoral thing known. These movies are going to show for a long time. Hey everybody, welcome back to Not So Small World. I'm Joe. And I'm Sam. And every episode we go through the uh, making, the creation, the art, the cultural impact of each Disney movie. And today, of course, is Zootopia. Thanks for tuning in. We typically try to interview people who worked on the movies, if there's anybody alive <laughs> who still worked mm -hmm. on them. Uh, but this time we actually interviewed three people. Um, you saw the clip at the beginning of the episode. If you want to see our interview with Cameron Stevens, who is a production coordinator, you can go here. If you want to see our interview with Tim Simonek, who's an incredible orchestrator, he's had a long career in the industry working all the way from things like Laverne and Shirley up until things like the Planet of the Apes movies and um, well, a bunch of the Pixar films and the mm -hmm. Star Trek films, you can go to here. And if you want to see our interview with fellow orchestrator Jeffrey Cricka, you can go right here. He worked on projects such as The Imagineering Story, which he composed for. But first, we're just going to kind of talk about our impressions. I know you really love this movie, Sam. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that? The the whole design of the movie really wowed me, uh, the, especially the character design. Uh, yeah. Corey Loftus was pretty much in charge of that whole department, um, designing a lot of the characters. And, and he's yeah. worked on movies like uh, like Wreck It Ralph, right? Mm -hmm. I believe, or at least the sequel. Yeah. And he did a lot for Raya and The Last Dragon. Mm -hmm. I think the the message and themes of the movie are are really relevant to issues that are not new, but that we are, are still facing today. Mm -hmm. Like the the way it's presented feels a little bit more adult oriented, I think, a little bit more than your average Disney movie for sure. Yeah, it's a soft way to introduce these issues to kids. Yeah, I think. And it's certainly, I, I respect that they didn't just go with the easy route, which could have just been like, love everybody, everyone get along. Mm -hmm. it, it it does try to complicate things a little bit more. Yeah. You know, when we're even talking about the ways in which you know they're they're talking about bigotry and bias. They work in, you know, the microaggressions, which to me felt, again, more than what your standard kind of family movie would do with that. Mm -hmm. Like, what does he say to, what does he say to Judy a couple times that she gets kind of miffed by? Well, he calls her cute. Mm -hmm. uh, he also kind of assumes she's a carrot farmer. Right, right. He, like, cause he calls she, her carrots. Yeah, and like, because she gives off this, like, naive country girl vibe, right. you know? And something that Judy says to Nick is, you are a very articulate fellow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or a very articulate fox or something like yeah. that. And that's, once again, that's something uh, I know a lot of minorities uh, hear a lot from white people who are surprised that they might... Like, they don't have the accent they were expecting. Like, if you if you really want to go a step further into the interpretation of the movie, I, I could kind of read the way in which the, the government was kind of, like, turning the predators savage as a commentary on the way in which the Reagan administration was increasing arrests to try to like make themselves look good in, in, the, in the war on drugs and everything so like in that regard again like would i expect that from a disney movie like that's crazy mm -hmm. so while i feel like it has its flaws in these metaphors like it does do some interesting things with it too but we can go into that a little bit later uh i i remember seeing this movie in theaters and i also really love the, the look of the whole thing. And I think mm -hmm. one thing I really appreciate about it is just the sense of scale they yeah. created. You know, like when I heard, oh, they're doing a talking animal movie and they're trying to make it seem like a like a brand new idea. I'm just like, I've seen this before. Like Disney's done that. Right, but they but they work the ways in which the animals coexist with each other really brilliantly. Mm -hmm. And even just the way the camera moves throughout each scene you really get the sense that like the drafts are this tall and yeah. the rodents are like this tall. They maintain a consistent sense of scale. Right. And they actually had four different main animal scales, right? Yeah, like four different categories. Um, they had like your your larger animals and then you like, I guess would you say like moderately sized animals? Mm -hmm. They had animals that um, were basically like human size, uh, like Nick and Judy were human yeah. size. But then you had that in between, which were kind of like the yaks. Yeah, and yeah, kind of stuff. and then the small, like the mice and the um, all the all the tiny rodents. Yeah, and I just I, I love that they don't like stretch that too much. Like it, mm -hmm. you really feel the size of everything throughout the whole movie. Right. But just kind of rewinding a little bit, one of the things that we thought was most interesting, uh, that certainly captured our attention the most, was how different the movie originally was. And this movie's been through so many different phases. Um, now, originally, uh, 
the main director, Byron Howard, um, had pitched several animal-based movies because he loved movies like Robin Hood and stuff like mm-hmm. that where Disney had these, you know, animals acting like humans. Right. And uh, so he had one that was like a pitch about a mad doctor cat and it was like a 60s B-movie, like sci-fi kind of thing. Um, he also had one about a space pug bounty hunter and that was called, and it slowly became this other thing called Savage Seas, which was a spy movie. So I think you can still like see hints of the kind of spy movie, kind of mystery mm-hmm. stuff going on, but they ended up evolving it further. So the prey outnumber the predators ten to one, as they have constantly said, and basically the predators were a type of minority. And in order for prey to feel safe, they gave them these, uh, they made them wear these shot collars, so that any time a predator felt the need to be aggressive, the prey could control. When well, did they have a remote, or the collar just sensed when they were? I think it was any time they got too like excited or emotional, yeah. they were shocked, which yeah. is like really dark. It's really pretty dark, <laughs> yeah. And so you had this whole society of people who were not only just representationally oppressed, but like were visually mm-hmm. oppressed using like these big collars. Metal collars with a blinking light on it. Now, if you've ever taken Psych One Hundred One, you probably recognize when I say that part of the inspiration came from the uh, experiment that was done in the 60s by the school teacher. Uh, She was trying to teach her kids about bias and about bigotry Mm -hmm. and how it forms. And she basically told these little kids, like, all of you with blue eyes, now you're the the superior children. And she had, like, she basically treated them different all all day long. And all of a sudden, like, all the kids with different eye colors... um, you saw a very vast difference in how those kids treated each other throughout the whole day. Um, And then the next day she flipped and said stuff like, well, all the kids with brown eyes now are the like best children. We must treat them better than the other children. And it was, they all were able to see how easily everyone fell into those, those lies just because someone told them that that one was better than the other. Mm -hmm. Now, Nick was kind of a similar character to what we see in the final film, but his storyline was very different. He was basically trying to get a loan from the banks uh, for this place called Wild Times, and it was basically um, an, an area where predators could be themselves and be aggressive without fear of being like judged or, or shocked. Yeah. More importantly, it was like almost like Dave and Buster's a bit, but yeah. for predators. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, basically. Um, which you could read a lot of social context into that as well. Whether you know, maybe it's just how different sexual minorities um, finding places where they can be themselves and and gather around other people who are similar to them. Um, I know that that director Byron Howard is gay himself, so when I see some of the, like, context of how they're talking about bigotry and stuff, I can't help but wonder if he, like, felt personal about that in Mm -hmm. some ways, you know? Now, in this original version of the story, Judy was there, but she was definitely a secondary character. but just the whole storyline followed along that sort of dystopian path. Like he was, you know, just like many other minorities in the real world, he was unable to get this loan. He was asking prey animals for loans. And of course they were discriminating against him because he's a predator and they weren't giving him the loans. And right. he went to the the mafia who are also predators. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Kozlov, who was the main bodyguard for uh, Mr. Mr. Big, Mr. Big. Mm-hmm. and in that version of the story, there's a really just like haunting scene where um, that was cut out. That was cut out of the out of you know the original story, where basically Judy watches firsthand and she sees how different um, predators are treated. And in this scene, Kozlov is like. There's like a party because his bear is now old enough to, re- like his young little cub is now old mm-hmm. enough to receive a shock collar. And it's this moment where the, the, the bear cub is just excited because it's like, I'm, I'm becoming an adult or whatever. Mm-hmm. But you see the tragedy of when he puts it on, the little cub gets very excited and gets shocked for the first time. And he, he, he like gets that first taste of what it means to be seen as dangerous mm-hmm. in, that, in that world while the father just has to kind of look on and try to put on a smile for for his son. It's just, it's just really heartbreaking. Um, and I can totally see why it was really hard to move away from that version of the story because it looked really compelling. They had a screening at Pixar with the original version of the story, and Pixar said they had a, a very cynical view of Z- Zootopia because they were seeing it through Nick's eyes and, he, and his experience. 
which is why they moved it to Judy, because she's so optimistic, and then she learns that not everything is what she thought it was going to be when she moved to the city. As a whole, even though I think the story we ended up with works better in that regard, because I think Judy is a really great main character, um, it sure is tantalizing to hear about this other version of the story, Mm -hmm. because, you know, it, it was so dark in a way that I don't feel like Disney's really touched maybe since even Pinocchio. Um, and I, I almost wonder if they would have even allowed that to come out in that form, just because it doesn't really sell toys when you're creating this dystopian, uh, you know, animal, like, you know, strange Not society. Not only that, can you imagine toys coming out of the predators of collars yeah and then yeah. they the kids kind of replay that like oh yeah so that there's another angle for you like <laughs> now with real shocks all you have to do <laughs> is press the button and even so how the movie ends up being while like you said i think i, I respect how far they're going in terms of particularly portraying that you know people who are discriminated against in society can still perpetuate bad worldviews against other people and so it's like it's really important for all of us to be able to look at you know where we're limited and and ways that we're furthering bias and that's a, that's a, an incredible message for a family movie mm-hmm. where the metaphor kind of starts to to get mixed for me uh comes down to when they talk about how predators are portrayed in the film if you know anything about the way that in particular black folks have been portrayed throughout western civilization um many racist people try to say that there is a biological reason why black folks are treated inferior and they'll make up stuff about i don't know head size or they'll make up stuff about they just aren't as smart as white people or something like that and it's you know all these awful things Mm -hmm. and so i think it's from what I've seen, a lot of black critics found it particularly painful that your analogy for the Predators, which, you know, while it covers a lot of minorities, does seem comparative to how black people are treated in society quite a bit. When you're, tie- when you're tying that to biological differences, I could see how that would be extremely painful. Well, and the, the Predators actually have biological differences yeah. which makes the metaphor it kind of weakens it a little bit they actually like yeah in the movie predators actually did legitimately have biological differences that caused them to kill the prey <laughs> and yeah. they're like working past that but it, it's still again when you're comparing that to real world analogies that's just the problem with metaphor your me- metaphor is always going to be limited right and you know I think overall they do a pretty good job of avoiding that, but I, like I said, I do know that some people were really bothered by that mm-hmm. and felt like it didn't 100% work for them, and I totally get that. And I guess just the other thing for me, like especially in a post-George Floyd world, um, you know, an extremely positive, uncritical kind of portrayal of the police is a little tough to swallow. I guess, okay, I guess they do show that the police force has bias, especially with Chief Bogo, but, um, you know, it's, it's not gonna go to the depths of something like The Hate You Give, which I think is a, is a mm-hmm. really nice job if you want, like, a more family-friendly, at least if you have teenagers and older, kind mm-hmm. of approach to the complexity of um, bigotry and how institutionalized it is within our societies. Again, I don't think Disney was ever gonna go that deep, um, but, you know, that's just, that, that's one of the things that prevents me from putting it, like, as one of my favorite Disney movies or anything like that, you know? Mm-hmm. But anyway, back to the, the rest of the story with Judy. Uh, I said I really like her as a main character. Mm-hmm. What do you think about her? I really like her, too. Um, I think her, her drive is very admirable. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as someone who's always wanted to live in the, in the city and now finally does... I, I love that and relate to that part of her character. <laughs> well, and, and as someone who has trouble finding motivation, I, I really I really find that really, you know, I admire that of someone you yeah, know, who yeah. tries really, really hard to achieve what they, what they want, you know? We saw that in the older version of the story. You did actually see more of her family. Yeah, they had like a really, they had a really large house because of course they played on the stereotype that, uh, I guess it's not stereotype, it yeah, actually happens, but right. that bunnies multiply, they reproduce very quickly, so mm-hmm. they had a large house, and she had all these siblings, and uncles, and grandpas, and um, they had a cafeteria where it was just a constant uh, 
flow of kids getting meals and people <laughs> yeah. cooking and yeah it's literally yeah. all day meals just all day it was, beginning to end of the day just right. rotating the bunnies in and out so that they can all be fed mm -hmm. you know you mentioned the thing about stereotype and maybe that's another thing that where the metaphor is limited to because so much of it is about like don't put people in boxes but then like half the jokes in the movies are about like isn't this animal funny because it does this Mm, yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, sloths are slow, but also we shouldn't make fun of, like, bunnies or whatever. And, like, <laughs> again, you know, like, I'm not, like, offended by that, but I totally, I think it muddies the message maybe a little. Yeah. <laughs> There's Flash the Sloth, speaking of sloths. The, um, the character designers decided to give Flash Byron Howard's hair. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think he knew that, that they were going to do that, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, kind of it's pretty. It's pretty subtle enough where he probably wouldn't notice right away. <laughs> right, right. And he does seem like a very chill guy. Oh yeah. So. <laughs> no, he. I think he liked it. <laughs> yeah, I think they said the only character design that did not change at all throughout the whole thing was Chief Bogo, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's his role and attitude pretty much just stayed the same. Right. I mean, if you're gonna have a cop movie, you gotta have that character, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and you gotta have the moment where the badge gets taken away and all hope seems lost and all that. <laughs> Right. Now, one of the subtle things they did to, like, mm. show that they're still animals, even though they act like humans quite a bit, is that, well, none of them have shoes. Mm -hmm. All of them still have animal traits built into how they are functioning within the world. Like, how Judy starts, like, her nose starts wiggling when, or mm -hmm. her ears start flopping when she's, like, looking for something. Um, and in terms of, like, the scale and stuff like that, they did things to make it very clear, like, like the cars, like they basically made mm -hmm. them look like they were just like shrunken down, like little toy cars, cars, little toy cars with a giant mm -hmm. steering wheel. Um, even even down to the clothing, right? The clothing helps mm -hmm. create the sense of scale in the characters. Yeah. So uh, mice characters, instead of having like s several really tiny buttons, they would have like one button. Yeah. <laughs> which is really cute. Right. Right. Whereas you know it would be like much more tailored for like an elephant, where you have mm -hmm. like tons of little tiny stitches and stuff. That. And they even made like the elephant's clothes really baggy. Right, right. Going back even to to Nick, one of the things they added was the, the I just love the detail of the tie. And they said they specifically made it look like he didn't even really know how to tie a tie. Like he was like pulling it off and just like tightening it up again every single day, which is just such a great detail. And I might add, I think Nick's intro in this movie is one of Disney's best character intros ever. <laughs> just the way that whole scene plays out mm -hmm. from being like this sympathetic moment kind of taking advantage of Judy's kindness to how you know to the reveal of just how big of a scammer he is is just I think hilarious mm -hmm. so as you probably know by now every time they make one of these movies they try to do some research trips for the like some of the main people involved and this time they went to Nigeria um, where they actually got to see a lot of animals in the wild they also went to Disney's Animal Kingdom which doesn't seem like quite as uh, <laughs> big of an adventure they saw in Nigeria that there is a, a large watering hole and all the animals no matter what species would gather around and get water and there's almost like this unspoken truce um, among the animals so like lions would be across like like almost not next to zebras but pretty close to zebras like mm -hmm. they're both trying to get water and, and they wouldn't attack each other and so they kind of created Zootopia around this idea of like a watering hole and all the species getting along so yeah. actually in the center of Zootopia is a, is a fountain that's like kind of like the watering hole. Right. And their idea is the founders of Zootopia uh, met at a watering hole right. and, and formed a truce. And might we say, I, in real life, I, they the prey does outweigh predators like nine or ten to one or something like mm -hmm. that. And they kept that up in the, in the, in the, in the movie. Right. Uh, I know we've also said like, they're, like the way that the environments are laid out and all work against each other is is so cool and so mm -hmm. fun and I think they're really gonna get a lot of mileage that like as of right now they've only announced the Zootopia Disney Plus show but that will be coming out in the next couple years and I, I really think that's a great opportunity to explore those areas more because I just feel like we get like a tiny taste mm -hmm. of all these different areas and uh, I think it's gonna be really fun to see them come up with some stories that like expand upon all, all those environments. I would love to see the Zootopia show in Brian Howard's style. Oh yeah, yeah he has because, a great drawing Yeah, style. I mean, it, it's so adorable and um, 
just the expressions are just fantastic. And yeah. I, I just really enjoy seeing his work. Like whenever he would draw something out for a scene, you can tell it was his, it was like he did it. And I, I would love to see the show in that style. Yeah, he's, he's had a long history at the company and he's still working on projects. He has Encanto, which as of this recording is still coming up later this year, I think. Um, so, I mean, I think we're both pretty excited for that one. So, you know, I always like to talk a little bit about the music of each of these movies. And with Michael Giacchino doing the score, I knew I wasn't gonna be disappointed. And like, sure enough, the this, this score for this is just so much fun. A lot of like really creative use of percussion and uh, a lot of really high intensity music. Um, but you'll have to skip forward to our interview section because we actually talked with two of the people who worked on the music for this film. And I think we learned some pretty cool stuff from both of them. So the movie came out, it was a huge success in pretty much every metric. Um, mm -hmm. It was a huge critical success, I think it has like a 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. Uh, it won the Oscar for Best Animated Feature, actually it beat out Moana, <laughs> and it beat out uh, like My Life with Zucchini and, and um, Kubo. And Kubo and the Two Strings. Right, right, mm -hmm. which we love that movie too. Yeah. Um, it made over a billion dollars at the box office, which um, <laughs> is, is pretty incredible and audiences seem to love it. It has like a huge fan base. I know at the time, Disney sort of uh, low key sent out some marketing to furries before the movie came out. And I totally, I think that totally makes sense. I think that rocks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were basically like, hey, this is like kind of your thing, kinda right? Your <laughs> this is up your alley. And, and sure enough, I think they kind of got them to share hashtags and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think in almost every regard, it's a pretty well received beloved movie um so it was just kind of continuing their their winning streak that they've been having around that time and, and, and you know the interesting thing is like it really does feel like a movie that was kind of made for the trump era even though it came out like even before he was elected uh, i think you can definitely tell from their academy award acceptance speech that they're like really proud to make something that celebrates like diversity, diversity. and differences and stuff like that um it's, it's, it's resonant in a way that I think a lot of recent Disney movies aren't gonna feel as specific to the time period, I guess. Would you like to introduce yourself to our audience, Cameron? Sure, well, I mean, for the purposes of this, you wanted to talk to me about Zootopia. I was the look development coordinator on Zootopia. And what does a look development coordinator do? Or even just, what does a production coordinator do in general on an animation team? They're the ones that get the movie done on time and under budget. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably an asterisk besides the under budget thing because uh, Disney functions slightly differently from the way that they fund their films and the, the, what they eventually do with those films. But yeah, I mean, generally speaking, we try to get the film done on time, which is sort of ironic since uh, Zootopia did have to push six months so <laughs> we try our best <laughs> yeah i imagine i work at a very small studio myself um just locally where we are in ohio and just keeping track of budget stuff on a small uh, documentary level is interesting enough i can only imagine how interesting that gets when you have something that's being pushed internationally and has you know toys and and all kinds of merchandise riding on it like is do you feel like that pressure uh is there and present when when you were working on these films yeah i mean the reality is is there's definitely a feeling at disney such that they'll spend the money to get it right because of all of those things that you mentioned there's the merchandise which is huge there's right. theme parks there's there is also this feeling that, and I think that's still true to this day, I think it's the thing that actually helped sort of revive Disney animation, if you will. It's the content creator for Disney as a brand. I mean, they own so many other things now, so there's so, so many other things kind of kicking out. But like, especially around that time, I mean, this was like Frozen had, had just come out and blown up, um, Big Hero 6, and then on to Zootopia. I mean, these were, they were creating intellectual property that they could use in so many different facets. So f because of that, it was very, very important to get it right. And they were like, okay, we'll spend the more money so that we make this as big as it possibly, possibly can be. Like what was your experience with like how did the story change throughout and like how did you, how did you feel about those changes? 
Disney has a very interesting process with its story, right? So they, 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 do, they do a lot of story work really, really early on. Um, but a lot of times they will put a film into production when the story isn't uh, ready is not necessarily the right word, but definitely not finished. Mm. Um, and Zootopia was, was an example of that. I think that there's a lot of pressure from a lot of different aspects of the company as a whole to really kind of get things just, they need to start building things. They can kind of sometimes go into production on stuff that you're just like, there's, there's not much here yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that was the case with Zootopia. I think that even all the way up to the top, they'll admit it. Um, but one of the interesting things about the story process at Disney is they do many different screenings and they let the, uh, well, they let the whole studio come to the screenings and they take feedback from everybody. I mean, you could be a production assistant and they let you write in your notes. They might not listen to those notes, but they, <laughs> they you know, they let everybody say, hey, this is what I like. This is what I don't like usually specifically they're looking for don't like or areas that they can improve on. I mean, you guys probably know this, but the, the story was, was not about hops originally. Mm -hmm. Um, hops was a very, very secondary character, um, for probably the first five, six screenings. Um, it was all about Nick. Um, and I think that you know, I think there's a few reasons for that. Um, my theory was, you know, Jason Bateman, uh, well, still a pretty big star, but certainly really big at the time, obviously coming off of stuff like Arrested Development um, and uh, was kind of like the bigger name, if you will. Um, and I think that for whatever reason, they just kept focusing on him being the main character. But the reality was, is they couldn't really craft a compelling enough story around him. Uh, what I think they really were eventually trying to get at was uh, a, a deep thematic story. And what they had was kind of this, you know, sly con man guy who was fun, but it was, it was kind of puffy. It wasn't like it didn't mm. have substance to it. What I love about the story process at Disney is th they do just, they'll try anything. Right. And, and they give the story team enough time to actually do that. Right. So the film was well into production at this point. I mean, we were building stuff, we were creating worlds, we were building characters, we were doing everything. And somebody somewhere said, let's just rewrite the entire film, but change the main character. Mm -hmm. And there were very few threads from a story standpoint uh, that, that remain the same between, you know, the Nick centric version and then the hop centric version. Uh, and they just threw it out there and something really, really clicked. And I have, you know, I'm sure we can probably talk story themes. Um, but I think there's a couple of specific reasons why that worked really well and, and ultimately got us the movie that we have today. Do you think because of the way that they are and how massive they are, that they were able to do that, like take that complete overhaul that far down in the process. This isn't the first time we always hear about this stuff from both Pixar and Disney. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. there's so many times when, we, when we're researching, they say, you know, they got a couple years in and then they scrapped everything and completely yep. reflipped it. And, you know, I just think in some uh, places that would be completely unheard of. So do, do you think it's something about Disney that allows them to do that? Yeah, it is. Um, it's definitely unique to their creative culture and their story. But there weren't, uh, that's not to say that there weren't consequences because of it. I mean, like I said, we pushed six months. Um, we crunched really, really hard through the holiday. Um, we were definitely on, you know, six and some people on seven day weeks, you know. Oh, wow. I mean, this is kind of standard film industry, but like there's a point in the film where, you know, you're on 12, 13, 14 hour days and and you got to get it done. And one of the interesting things about the whole, um, you know, production process, especially towards the middle and the end, uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, but uh, most of the film was not done at the, the hat building, the Disney animation building. Um, almost all of it was done at a completely different building that nobody on the entire crew had ever been to and likely will ever be again. Uh, <laughs> Uh, except for their time on Zootopia. So that was sort of an interesting mm. wrench that got thrown into everything as well. What was the reason for that? Why, why was there a separate building? 
when Disney acquired Pixar, one of the things that John and Ed, well, you, you probably know this, but they were the big advocates for keeping Disney animation alive. Right. Like, there was a lot of ideas of just sort of fusing that or maybe Disney kind of animation kind of goes away and just becomes Pixar. And they were the big advocators for keeping Disney animation as a separate thing. And um, I think really in short, it was a gift to, uh, after the success of Frozen, they wanted to give everybody a brand new building. Um, they had this iconic building in this fantastic location um, that you can't miss when you're driving on the highway near Burbank. It's, it's the big blue hat, um, big animation letters. Um, but it was old, you know, I mean, like it still had kind of, you know, weird dated carpet and <laughs> it's kind of dark. And uh, according to, um, to John and Ed, it was just not befitting of where they wanted the, the studio to go. And the, the, you know, granted, you know, Pixar has their compound up in Northern California. It was kind of like, Hey, you know, if we're going to do this whole thing together, we should, we should have a great building. So Unfortunately, you know, there's no other way to do it besides get everybody out and and renovate. And we did it. Uh, we were up in a very industrial area of North Hollywood uh, on a street called Tahunga. It was called the Tahunga Building. Mm -hmm. um, and if you remember in Zootopia, there's a joke. We have a 1091 Jaguar gone savage. Mine is Tajunja. It's Tahunga. <laughs> nice throwback to all of the work that was done at the Tahunga building. Mm -hmm. A cool place, big industrial warehouse. There was actually a lot of um, like old Imagineering stuff because it's so big. It was like a really tall, uh, high ceiling. So they had like a lot of um, like ride components that were being built in other sections and stuff. Yeah. It was cool. Like granted, the new building is really sweet and it's, it's nice that everybody's back. But that was definitely an experience. What, what was it like working with the directors with Byron and Rich? And yeah, I mean, I've known Byron for a long time. Uh, I remember when Byron was an animator on, uh, or he went, he might have been head of animation on Lilo and Stitch. Oh. Um, yeah, back in the Florida days. Um, Byron's great. He's like the happiest guy in the entire world. He seems so sweet. <laughs> oh, he's amazing. So what's interesting about um, Byron is that. This was his first feature film since Tangled, you know? It's like he had some really great stuff. I mean, Lilo and Stitch, Bolt, Bolt arguably being one of the films that sort of helped put 3D Disney animation on the map. Right. Um, and then Tangled, you know, um, uh, you know, very successful. And then was kind of just working in the background for a while. And it was sort of, I think, a return to form for him. I think, it, you know, um, he has one more film coming out. Um, so I, I don't know. Maybe that'll be his last one. Maybe it'll keep, well, keep going. But um, that was cool. And then Rich, Rich is an interesting guy, man. That guy is so... Uh, he's a bit off the wall. <laughs> I got that <laughs> He impression. seems like it. <laughs> he's very... Like, Byron's very um, conscientious and controlled with his creative notes. He's a, he's a very intellectual thinker when it comes to story. Rich is just like firing on all cylinders at all <laughs> points in time. Um, and obviously, you know, he, he made Ralph and uh, what, uh, what I think was a, a quite successful film. Um, I personally don't think there was any Frozen without the success of Ralph. So mm -hmm. I got to give that a lot of credit. Um, plus, I'm a video game nerd. So <laughs> Ralph, Ralph has a soft spot in my heart. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, I they didn't always get along, um, but I also don't believe that perfectly getting along all the time leads to the best creative outcome. So yeah. um, the ability to sort of play off each other, even if you're not necessarily agreeing all the time, I think allows you to s distill down to the best story possible. And, and they got Zootopia out of it, you know? You know, I had a, a good... Uh, run in the in the film industry and it's the only academy award winning film that i've worked on which is a which is a nice feeling in and of itself but to me i think from a thematic standpoint and especially the time period that the film came out and really to today um i'm i'm proud of it because it just it's so relevant far beyond when it was made 
Um, and I personally think it's, it's uh, one of the, I guess you might, you, I guess you could call it edgier, but maybe more adult themed mm -hmm. um, Disney films. And I, I think it really kind of, it, it was, it was the film that said, Hey, like, yeah, we can make a billion dollars doing a musical, but like, we can also have some really poignant relative, uh, uh, you know, you know, in today's world, social commentary. So that's why I think the film stands up today. With the positive experiences you've had in the film industry, why did you decide to change from that career path? Yeah, yeah. Well, how much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I actually was an intern with Disney Animation way, way back in the day, junior year of college. So I've kind of been sort of surrounded. You know, I know a lot of folks in the film industry been surrounded by the film industry for a long time and in all honesty I kind of fell into it um I went into the workforce in 2010 this was right after the 08 and 09 crash there like was not much available but I had the opportunity to come out and uh just be a PA out in LA um which was great for 21 year old me but mm -hmm. I uh, was not very forward thinking and I was kind of just like this is a fun thing to do and it allows me to to live in a place that I want to live but I didn't really put any thought to it being whether or not I wanted it to make my career long term I saw a lot of stories of people who were like you know I, I, I saw my first Disney film at you know seven years old and that was it I wanted to work at Disney Animation that's the only place I've ever wanted to work and and now I work here and it is literally my dream it wasn't my dream. And I, and there was a point in time where I felt like I was, I was taking up a slot, a very coveted slot, to be fair, uh, that could have gone to somebody that was just like, yeah, I'm head over heels to be here. Um, so uh, I, I went on a journey to, to find what that thing was for me, you know? I mean, now uh, I'm a real estate agent in Los Angeles, something I really, really love doing. And I would say that maybe more than half of my clients are folks from Disney Animation. So oh, I haven't left that world completely. I love <laughs> being able to take people that, you know, uh, that I used to work with on Zootopia or the other projects and, and um, you know, work with them in a different capacity. So it's cool. And, and, you know, I still know so many people within the industry and I still get to go to events every now and then. So it's, it's still fun. I guess to just wrap things up, do you have anywhere that, or anything that you'd like to plug? I co-host a podcast on spirits, which is called the cartel hour. Um, we recently had some big folks, Metallica, um, Terry Bradshaw, um, <laughs> crazily enough, Slipknot has a whiskey and they recently came on the show for us. That was a blast. Oh, wow. Um, so that's fun. So that's where if you're not in LA and you want to find me talk about booze, uh, the cartel yeah. hour. Thanks so much for joining us today. We also have Tim Simonek and uh, you were an orchestrator on Zootopia, correct? Yes, I was. So one thing that we wanted to ask you right off the bat is uh, we both love Michael Giacchino's work. I mean, especially I've been a longtime Pixar fan for a while, and I know you've uh, done work for many of their films. Uh, right. what, what, what is it like working with him? What is, what, what is he like as a person? Well, Michael and I have, you know, been friends since he first started. I started working with him in 1998 on, some, on video games when he was doing his first video games we would record. And um, I, I know his family. I, I, was, I was there the day his, two of his kids were, were born at the hospital. And I know his, like, his parents and his brother and his sister and, of course, him. So I've, I've known Michael a long time. You know, it's been wonderful working with him. And he, he likes to have a good time, much like I do. So his sessions are very enjoyable. Um, and he always picks good directors to work with. And the directors of Zootopia were not an exception. I just love those two guys. So One thing I always love about his work is that I feel like he takes opportunities within the score to use instruments that don't always get featured a lot in film mm -hmm. soundtracks. And one of the things that we loved seeing in the making of Zootopia was the unusual percussion that, that he utilized. 
he does love doing that. And, and there's a gentleman who is no longer with us, Emil Richards, who was the percussionist and he's like the king. He has, he has percussion instruments that he developed you know, 50 years ago you know, in the 50s to put in films like the original Planet of the Apes. And I remember how excited my, Michael went when he first went to Emil's warehouse and just saw everything that was there and got demonstrations. And he was like, he, and he taped everything. And, and I, I know how much he enjoyed that. One of our upcoming interviews is actually with um, a, uh, a fellow Zootopia orchestrator. Um, we're wondering if you knew him. Um, he, his name is Jeffrey, uh, is it Krika? Yeah, Krika. Krika, okay. Yeah, my, he started working with Michael early, you know, three, four years ago, and he would be the gentleman who would, Michael would write it in sequencers, and then somebody would have to like translate it and make it real, um, uh, we call it the prep, and get it to me for the final orchestration. And Jeff did that in the process for you know several years, and then Michael wanted to work him into the orchestration because he did show a good you know a knack for doing that. So he would do a couple orchestrations per movie, and and so he he's more the orchestrator and the prep guy. So I've known Jeff for oh, by about four or five years. And Zootopia had an interesting thing because usually Michael wanted me to do all the orchestrations, but on Zootopia, my father-in-law passed away. So I had to go to the funeral, come back, and, and Jeff was very helpful in doing some of the orchestrations that I couldn't finish. So he, he took some of the load and, to, and ably did it. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. So I imagine with like the all the projects you're working on, I, I can imagine it can, it can get kind of busy. Um, so how do you time manage? How do you stay on top of such a busy schedule? Um, it, it usually is a busy schedule because we're last in the whole process, the music, before the final mix of the film. And um, it can be pretty crazy. You know, I, you get, you have to be pretty pro prolific as an orchestrator to do all that's coming down. And usually it does come to, even though I'm, for most of Michael films, I was the main orchestrator, but depending on how crazy the schedule is, you know, we brought in other people like Jeff, you know, and other orchestrators I would bring in to, you know, finish everything because you got, you kind of have to have it done. Yeah, like what is the time span that you're working on each individual project? Is it something where it's you're in, you're out, or do you spend a little bit more time familiarizing yourself with the pieces? Michael tends to be very prolific and fast, so I get the stuff, but um, you, I would say three weeks is three to four, but sometimes it can be one or two. You know, there's all kinds of stories in Hollywood of, you know, guys who have scored films in four days and then, you know, big ar ar army of orchestrators, you know, come in. That's usually, you know, if the scores get thrown out or something, but my, Michael tends to work on a very good schedule and knows I need to get the stuff so we can get it ready to record. So he's very helpful in the process. He's not saying, well, you know, and he has to, of course, show it to the director and get comments and changes. So uh, I, I always tell orchestrators or young orchestrators, I, you better be fast. Do you have much say over the different people within the orchestra and how they're chosen for each project, or is that decided by a different person higher up? Or oh, I, I usually, uh, from the beginning, I pretty much recommended people to Michael. And as he got to know more and more people, he would, you know, bring, you know, bring in people. It, it was kind of a process between me and Michael. And there is a contractor that does hire um, players too, Reggie Wilson. So it's it's a process really with the three of us. I can suggest things to Michael. Of course, the final decision is his, you know, but as I'm orchestrating it, and I say, you know, it'd be really nice if we have this instrument, you know. And so sometimes we'll get that um, unusual instrument, you know, that you mentioned that you don't necessarily hear, hear on animation, or Michael ha can have that idea from the beginning. So oftentimes he does, where he says, well, I, I want to work this instrument in and that. So uh, what I like with Michael, it's it's never the same old, same old. Every, every movie is 
a little different approach, a little different orchestral approach. I forget, did, did you work on any of the Star Trek, uh, the recent Star Trek movies? All of them. Oh, okay, that's one uh, of Sam's absolute favorite soundtracks. I love those movies, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I liked all of them. Michael does pick good movies, and he, he picks great directors. Of course, we work with Brad Bird a lot, and J.J. Abrams. Like, J.J. and Brad really like the old film scores. So they're not like, I, I've worked on a lot of movies in, with other composers where the director doesn't really sit and enjoy the process. You know, they have to still micromanage, and they're not, you know, they're insecure. They're not knowing if this is going to work. And usually, like I say, with um, in, in a Zootopia, by the time we get to that mo the moment of recording, the directors, all by and large, that Michael's work Michael works with, they love the they love the process of the scoring. They enjoy it. You know, they're they're anticipating it. They're not dreading it or trying to micromanage. They just lean back and enjoy it. You know, and I, I think the kind of person Michael is and his enthusiasm helps helps them be uh, that way. Setting the tone is so crucial. And mm. I think that it's a hard thing to like grasp exactly, but if you can get everyone feeling like they're on the same page or they're feeling included and excited to be part of it, I think that's invaluable. I tend to try to set a real light, fun tone with the orchestra as I'm conducting, you know, enjoyable. Did you play better if you're, um, if you're having a good time and it's relaxed or if you're being screamed at all the time. I've never heard of a great musician that I all I've talked to is, no, I like to be screamed at all the time. <laughs> and conductors can have that, um, they can have that reputation, often do. In terms of pet peeves, do you ever get bothered when you see people imitating a conductor and they're just, they don't even know what they're doing and they're just kind of waving their hands and... <laughs> no, I don't mind, I don't mind. Uh, when, in a lot of the movies we did, Chris Pine in Star Trek, and uh, who else have we had? And we, we have Tom Cruise in every movie we have. And we, uh, we had uh, Leonard Nimoy, actually. And we, always, we would always have him conduct a cue from the movie, to come up as the guest, introduce him, and then actually have him conduct it. Even in the, in the case of those three people, they never conducted. You give them the baton, and I'd have to give them a quick, you know, a very quick lesson and they do it. Tom Cruise picked it up like crazy. <laughs> and Leonard Nimoy did. I mean, he was he was good. And Chris Pine, Chris Pine was great. He was like a kid in a candy store enjoying the scoring stage and, and enjoying the whole process and he had more questions than an interviewer of us. Well, that begs the question then, are you afraid to be replaced by Chris Pine now? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, if it happens, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I would say, I won't try to act if you don't try to conduct. Um, so would you say, like throughout the years, that has your craft evolved or changed over the time? Well, yes, when, you, when I first started, you know, orchestrating back in the 70s and, and even 80s, uh, a, synthesizers hadn't, you know, in um, samples and all the all the sounds that they can create to, to mock up a score. They were just, you know, they weren't in the picture. So a lot of orchestra composers would write, and John Williams still does, um, a literal five stave score in pencil, and then you would orchestrate it. Now. The technology does enable you to um, hear it, you know, hear it with the instruments, you know, the samples and all the instruments playing it, and you can get a real idea of what it sounds like. Back when I started, you come to the scoring stage and everybody's hearing it for the first time. And that can be wonderful and that can be tragic. It can go bad either way. I had one where I was actually the composer and I played it for him on the piano, the, the director. We came to the session the next day and the orchestra, you know, played it down and he came charging out of the, out of the booth screaming at me, what is that? That doesn't sound like what I said, you know? And then now, you know, somebody like with John Williams will put it on the synthesis, uh, put it on the machines much like Jeff did a little with Michael and in that respect. And then you can play it for the director 
and he can kind of hear what the orchestra kind of sounds like. He can see it with the picture, what you're trying to. So the technology has let you know a lot more. And the bad thing of what the technology kind of has done, you don't have to be as musical as a composer. There's a, and a, there is a, a degree of that where they're a little more novices. They're not experienced with an orchestra. They're not experienced. You know, they're coming in either a, a friend of the director or, you know, some rock and roll artist who really may not have the musical chops. Now, Michael did. I mean, he obviously... He was writing before he even started writing for films, but but the technology can sometimes cover up some things or or enable somebody who can't do that much to still do it because he can still have somebody put the sounds in the box and tweak them and then the orchestrator tweaks them because the technology allows more people in the process to contribute to make it the best it can be. Uh, as you mentioned, you do um, composing yourself. Um how like what's what's your emotional headspace for composing versus just orchestrating for someone else's work well well co composing you're the guy doing it your, your your role is just to write the best music you can but when you're the orchestrator you are trying to interpret what the composer michael in that case to interpret it to sound the best it can sound to pick up everything he's done and if you have to add a little more to it, you add a little more to it, but you never want to change the, the mood, the tenor. God forbid you change the, any melodies. You know, you know I, I, as an orchestrator, I don't do that. I don't change those things. I just try to make the piece better. Many times, many cases, what I get from Michael is so good. I just, um, I just basically have to put it on the page for the whole orchestra you know, a whole orchestra, but what he sent me was very complete. But when you are composing it, it's totally different. Now, one film I did, work, I know you asked about a couple, but the probably the film, the biggest film I've ever worked on as a composer is Whiplash. Um, I What I did on that film, I didn't write the underscore. Um, Justin Hurwitz did that capably, but Damien wanted me, he had a lot of me, what he wanted to do, Damien Chazelle, the director, is have the music be recorded before, almost like an animation. The music was recorded before um, they shot, as they're shooting the movie. And so he wanted to get uh, most of the actors he got to play in the big bands on stage. They could all, put, they were actors, but they could kind of play their instruments. And then we, re we recorded it before it got in the, um, in the, in the final movie. And, and the thing that I, I shouldn't say like an animation, I'd say like a musical. Uh, a musical, you'll record the music, then the singing, and then the acting. So, and what I did in that movie is everything you see on stage played by big bands, I either arranged or composed. And, and there's one thing, I mean, most people know if, if you've seen Whiplash, but you didn't know me then, um, J.K. Simmons, who's since then has become a very good friend, he tells me after they're done shooting the film, he says, you know, I mentioned your name in the movie, you know, and I said, it probably will get, he said, probably will get on the, on the editing room floor. And so I didn't think any more about it. So I go to the screening, the preview, and all of a sudden he comes on. It's when he introduces the piece to trip the drummer up near the end. But first, we're going to start out with a new tune by Tim Simonet called... Upswinging. My name will be on film forever. You can't tell me friends of mine all over the country, get out of the theater and call me right away. <laughs> you were mentioned in that movie. I said, yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was something I'll always cherish. And I thank JK for that. And I thank Damien for letting it stay in. So you did ask it and when you told me it was Happy Days. Yeah. And that was the first thing I ever composed for television. I just had gotten in LA and I struck up a, a friendship with the uh, head of music at Paramount of television music. And he threw, he threw that my way, that uh, happy, the couple happy days episodes. So, and that, that was totally different because you had to use a small orchestra. Again, you had a small amount of time, but um, it was enjoyable because happy days was such a big hit. You know, when I came to LA in 79, 
I think I did uh, the episodes mostly in 1980. I did some Happy Days and I wrote some cues for Laverne and Shirley and Mark and Mindy. You know, um, Happy, you know, Gary Marshall comedies were, you know, from, from Paramount were, that was all television that, you know, that was most of television, all those big comedies, Taxi, Cheers. Like when you look back and you've had the chance to work on all these extraordinary films and, mm -hmm. and shows that are even remembered for years to come, I mean, what is that, how does that make you feel? You know, it's a great feeling. It's a great question too, Joe. It, it makes you feel amazing that, you know, I'm, as I'm 69 now and you, never, you know, you don't know, you're, you're on the last quarter of your life, not the first three. And it's like, you know, I'll kind of be remembered because people will see my name on these films. You know, and I know a, a lot of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great feeling. There's an immoral thing known. These movies are going to show for a long time. Pixar movies are going to show a long time and Star Trek and some of these. It's great. And you feel like it's just great to be part of this. You know, I, I would drive onto the studio lots, you know, in early years and you know, all the time. And, and I'd never lose the wonder of saying, I can't believe it. I'm actually driving wow. on Paramount and I'm working. On, on a movie and, and working on the music is what, when I first had that ambition in the early 70s, I, wanna, I wanted to write music for films. You know, I, I said, I thought about it as a kid. I would go to movies and he, look at the soundtrack credit and say, man, I hope someday I get to do that. I, I, and I kind of believed in my heart I would. And lo and behold, I did. Well, thanks so much for coming on our show, Tim. It's, it's really been an honor to talk to you. Well, I, I, I've so enjoyed your show. I, I like your enthusiasm for film music and, you know, and to give orchestrators some credit. Sometimes we, we get lost in the shuffle, you know. Um, I usually tell the director when I meet him, I'm, I'm the conductor, because a lot of them don't know what orchestrators do. So I, I'm very thankful that you give, uh, you give some screen time and questions orchestrators way. It's, I talk for all the other orchestrators to thank you for doing that. So we'd also like to welcome orchestrator Jeffrey Kricka to our show as well. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> One of the other people we talked to was uh, Tim Simonek, another uh -huh. orchestrator. Um, uh, he spoke very kindly about you, actually. He said that um, there was a time where he had a family emergency and you filled in for him, like, no questions asked, short notice. Yeah, yeah, it's just... The thing you do when you work on teams, right? You sort of know that you can rely on each other. Um, you know, no one person should ever be expected to, you know, do everything. So with him being the lead orchestrator, what is your duties as someone who's not the primary person that they pull in? Yeah, so like, usually the way it works is, you know, Michael, when, when he's writing, he would probably prefer to uh, have as little people you know, uh, work on the orchestrations as possible. So, so in the case of the lead orchestrator, he's going to try to have the lead orchestrator do as much of the work as possible. But potent, you know, potentially we we run into like busy schedules or you know emergencies or things like that, right? And so then it's good to have other orchestrators around who can kind of, you know, pick up you know some of the cues, um, sort of spread out the amount of work. A little bit so that you know not just one person is having you know to work tirelessly on the entire score it's nice when you have the time you know allotted to be able to do that but um it's also good to be able to sort of spread it around a little bit so that <laughs> you get some some more sleep than you would otherwise <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah actually looking at your resume you've worked with michael giacchino quite a bit so have you become like one of his go-to people yeah yeah lately anyway uh I mean, I, I guess the first project we worked on was about 10 years ago, now that I think about it. It would have been like 2011, I think. So, and I was still a student at UCLA then, grad student. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's not like I just started working with him and then suddenly he's giving me all this responsibility. You always kind of have to like build trust and build relationships with people. Right. And what, what is he like? What is it like working with him directly? Oh, he's just, it's incredible working with him really. Uh, you know, he's um, someone who really, really likes to use the orchestra and, and write melodically and, and always try like different things too. Like he's never one to like 
sort of rest on his laurels. It always feels like a um, like an I spy of music when like I remember like I was so excited um, in the Ratatouille soundtrack. He uses like vibraphone at points, and I love that. You just don't normally hear that, but yeah, I mean, just one thing that we love is seeing how he used percussion in in that movie. Just like you were saying, uh, from what we saw, it, like it looks like they even swapped out elements of like a traditional drum kit. Yeah, Bernie Dressel and Michael like got together. Bernie Dressel's his, his drummer. Uh, they got together before Zootopia and Michael was like, so how can we do like a drum set, but not <laughs> instead of the kick drum, it's like a wash bin basin, right? Instead of the, the floor tom, the, the, the regular kind of like floor drum, it's this oil can, oil drum or whatever. The, the crash symbol is like this crazy like spiral symbol and all the, all the drum heads have symbols on them. So when you hit them, it gets this like metallic clang along with the the drums. So you, you still write for it in the same way you would like a normal drum set, but you're getting like a totally different sound out of it. Whenever you're starting on a new project, like where, where's your headspace at? Like, are you really excited to work on it? Um, like what, what's your headspace like? It's usually like preparing myself for the challenge to come. And, and usually the things that I'm thinking about early on are like, like I had said before, like, is there a new instrument that I'm going to need to learn how to write for? Uh, a particular style maybe that I'm not as familiar with and I need to listen to some music from that style to like sort of help understand what you know makes makes it work and what's unique about it that I can sort of integrate into what I'm doing and what Michael's doing just getting organized like looking looking to see how much music there is going to be to orchestrate coming coming ahead um yeah, all, all different kinds of things. It, the organizational aspect is actually really key because you're, you're working through so much music in such a short condensed time span. It's, it's really important to like know where all the pieces are at of everything. And last year we, we recorded a, a, um, a video game score, Medal of Honor. It was a video game score that we recorded, I think in like August last year. And we had to split up like the winds and brass and percussion and strings into separate groups, just because of the restrictions of how many people we could have in a room. And, you know, sometimes like film composers will do that anyways, because they like being able to manipulate and control the, the various elements of the, the mix. And that's not how like orchestras were re recorded traditionally. And, and Michael doesn't usually like doing that. He likes to have everybody together in the same room and kind of feeding off each other's energy. And so like, that's how we did Zootopia was with, all of the different elements of the orchestra, the percussion together, all in the same room, which I think is really important to like setting the right vibe, for, especially like a score like this, which is so like groove driven and style driven. So it just helps having everybody there together. Tim told us about how oftentimes when he's going into these scoring sessions, what he's seeing on the screen while he's playing, it's the first time he's ever seen it before. Is that your experience with it too? Yeah, usually it's the first time that I'm seeing the picture because Michael's writing to picture, but for the orchestrator to do their job, usually they don't need to see picture. I, I definitely remember having this experience on Zootopia and a few other films of Michael's that I've worked on where like, because the visual storytelling is, is so well done, even though you're kind of like moving all around the film out of order, by the end of the week of recording, I, th I think I remember very clearly having like a very clear idea in my head, like what this movie was about, what the story was, even though like we're recording without dialogue, we're only listening to the music and then the image, right? And so Michael's so good at like the storytelling aspect of what the music's doing that it's just those two things. All I need is like the picture and his music. And I, I feel like I know is enough that I need to know about the, the movie. Yeah, I remember um, reading in an interview, he was talking about how it feels like he's almost directing the story when he's writing music because mm -hmm. he, like, he was shooting, um, you know, videos with his friends and stuff when he was younger. He was like, he's always had like a very story structured kind of mind. I, I think that's, that's very apparent to me in how he composes music. Sometimes there's like a, a style of writing that's like just too close and it sort of becomes Mickey Mousing, it's called, where like the music is like falling every little kind of thing that happens in, in the picture. 
And Michael doesn't do that. It's like a slide whistle or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, that's not something that Michael's usually doing. It's, it's more like creating the right vibe and the right kind of like accompaniment to the storytelling that, that the music, I think, is really, that's the, the purpose for it to be there. So when you hear um, like music pieces out in the wild or even like during your work, um, what are some indicators that indi like, in your opinion, indicate well done orchestra orchestration? Yeah, that's a really good question. It really depends, I think, on the composer and depends on even like just the individual piece of music. So like each, each composer is gonna have, you know, a typical style of orchestration um, and each individual piece is gonna have unique demands, I think, on the orchestration. But in general, I would say the types of things that I'm usually listening for are like issues of balance and clarity. Like, I mean, like a really bad example of like bad orchestration would be like, you would never want to put like a bass flute over uh, like a blaring brass chorale or something, right? That's just, you're never, never going to hear the bass flute, right? So, I mean, that's a really extreme example, but uh, I'm, I'm always trying to think about like, is everything being properly heard? Um, are, are, is the balance really good between the different sections? Is everything in like a good register for it to be, you know, maximally uh, uh, clearly the idea come through? Thinking about like things like also the, the types of color combinations that I'm, that I'm getting, like am I overstaying any particular like color combination between instruments too much? Am I over-reliant on like particular doublings? And, or do I need to change it up a little bit more? Um, yeah, and just like, how is that making the, is the music interesting to listen to based on those decisions that you're making, I suppose. We know that you are also a composer in your own right. Um, actually, one of our favorite uh, pieces of your work is we watched the entirety of the Imagineering story. Oh, right on, yeah. I loved working on that. It was such a, such a treat. Thank you. Yeah. Was that your was that your biggest project to date when it comes to composing? I would say so. Yeah, it's definitely like the most difficult thing I think I've ever done on my own. Um, it was six episodes, right? And yeah, I worked on that. I guess it was two two summers ago. Yeah, and just lots and lots of music that needed to be written. And I'm a huge Disney fan, so like every you know, trip that my family would take when I was growing up was to Walt Disney World. So <laughs> I had this like huge history with with Disney and writing this, you know, documentary series. Just it was it was such an honor, but it was also I was really nervous that I was gonna screw it up. So I'm I'm glad to hear that you guys enjoyed it and I, I feel very proud of the music that got written for it. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things we talked about with Tim was the idea that you're helping to create a collaborative, positive space for mm -hmm. the people involved, um, which I think is important for almost every level of, of the creative act of making a film. I think yeah. that's that's a pretty important part. So, like, what do you do to make people comfortable when you're when you're leading them in such a way? Filmmaking is all about the collaboration for me. So, um, on on many different levels, right? Like. The composers collaborating with with the directors, the composers com collaborating with members of their team. Um, nobody's ever wanting to do any any one thing. It's all about like what different things can other people bring to the table, right? And also on the level of the musicians, right? So usually my interaction is like, what can I I bring to Michael that that he hasn't maybe already put there already? but is based on like ideas and frameworks that he's already sort of set up um, for me to kind of play around in. And then uh, on the other hand, when we get to the scoring stage, it's how can we, Michael and I, interact with the musicians so that it, it gives them a space to bring like, you know, these are like the most amazing players in the world really. And to allow them the freedom and creativity to bring, you know, their talents to the score. and you know, it, you start in one spot, right, with this conception of like what you think the score is kind of going to be. And it goes through all these permutations, through all these 
collaborations that you do with people that it it sort of becomes something else in the end that it never could have been conceived of at you know in, in, in square one so i i really love the sort of like discovery process of that throughout the whole process like what each individual person is kind of bringing to the table and i guess just finally um it, this year is the fifth year anniversary of Zootopia's release. Um, how do you feel about the project looking back on it with a few years uh, sort of between the release date and now? Very, very fondly. I mean, I, it's one of the favorite projects that I've had the fortunate opportunity to work on, I feel like. Um, it's always so hard to like know, like when you're working on something, you know, if people are gonna like, enjoy it, remember it well, become a classic or whatever. But I feel like Zootopia is one of those ones that people will kind of keep being, you know, coming back to year after year. It's such a well-made movie. And the story, I feel like it feels really timeless to me and, and rings true, um, even still like probably even more so today than it, than it did when, when we made it. Jeff, is there anywhere where people can find you online or follow your work in the future? can go to my website, which is uh, jeffkrikamusic.com. I'm happy to like answer people's questions there. You can email me through the website. We just want to say a big thank you to Cameron, to Tim, to Jeff. To you, everyone. To everyone. To, to you. <laughs> you. We, just, we love doing these interviews, and it's just it's so exciting to actually talk to the people who worked on these films. And just to wrap things up, uh, you can follow us on Instagram at Small World Sam Joe. Mm -hmm. uh, but probably the best thing you can do is subscribe or share the video, tell people about the show, watch more episodes. We have we have a ton more now. We keep growing our collection and i guess we'll see you next time we'll be doing fantasia as our next episode because we like to go back and forth across the disney timeline from the early ones to the most recent ones uh, so if you have any thoughts on fantasia be sure to leave them in the comments and we'll see you next time on not so small world